Uh, we record. So we had uh, three breakout room inquiries on the table. Uh, what's the contemporary analysis for the film? Um, how does Ida B. Wells' work disrupt your understanding of conventional history? And what stood out to you most about Ida B. Wells um, in the film? Who would like to share what was discussed in their breakout room? I'll share. So basically what we talked about was how she was a good journalist that she didn't just write to write. She wrote with a purpose, which was to inform people about lynching and help her community as well as um, um, that once she um, she had a best friend named, I think it was, I think you pronounce it Moss. I'm Moss. not sure. Moss. Moss. There you go. And that's um, so basically what happened between Moss was that he owned a black, uh, he was in, he opened a grocery store in, within his black community, but there was also another person that opened, a, well, had a grocery store, and he was William Barrett, he was the white person, and obviously he saw it as competition, but it, it was so outraging to me because it's like, how is it a competition? That's literally his community and you're over here profiting off of them with like making more, pro like, it was just so absurd. But anyway, so we saw his competition and William Barrett and a couple of other people, white people went and attacked the um, Moss's grocery store, but like they were obviously all, he wasn't, he knew what was gonna happen. So he and his friends also like tried to attack, but at the end there was more like white people. So they like beat them and then they got lynched. And um, I think they also said like that, they accused them of like raping and like just made up lies for like why they lynched them. But like Ida B. Wells was, best friends with him so she knew like something was up like this is not right like she, she knew you know and that's how she became a journalist and how she started to like um within journalism she started to advocate about lynching and all of that thank you lovely uh, very comprehensive uh, let's get two more comments what else was discussed in your breakout room Uh, I, can, uh, I can. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, you can go. You can. <laughs> no, no, I insist. Oh, um, I was just gonna talk about how, like, I love how um I W Wells. She still like, no matter how much she moved up, like in her social status, like she was, she was really for African Americans. Like she didn't let like her status keep her from helping them and for for you know trying to figure out a way to like help them better themselves or help them find like housing she went out of her way to help them like she wanted better for them she didn't let like her status get in the way of that i yeah. guess like the people from the, the old set settlers club i guess mm -hmm. um i also had a question about that so were they like people who would work or who were they exactly because I, I was a little confused on um on who they were and like what they did so um, let me see. So there, there, there was two factions, and I, and I could be mistaken, but I, I believe she has. Um, there was one called the Negro Fellowship League, which she created that would allow um, Black folks who migrated from the South to kind of get them set up and get them to transition into Chicago, um, I should say, safely, right? Um, but the Old Settlers Club, those were the people who's been in Chicago and they, and they had you like prove that you've been in Chicago for over 30 years to show that you have long standing roots in the city. Because what was happening was while these Africans were migrating from the South, right? The people who's been in, who've been in Chicago felt as if they were bringing down um, the class of the people who were been in Chicago for a very long time. So they established these old settler clubs and say, well, you know what? I've been in Chicago for a long time. This is, I'm part of the old community, right? I'm not part of those who are newly migrating here and bringing down the social culture of, of Chicago. Does that make sense, Kimberly? Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, and Carney, were you going to say something? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, yeah, we were talking about how, like, it's so interesting how she was kind of, like, under the radar. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and uh, I took a woman's studies course once and we talked about, like, um, how, like, Black females 
had it even worse than black males because like even black like if a black male said the things she said or wrote the things that she did like they would for sure be lynched and like because she was a female i think she was kind of like un um just kind of like flying under the radar not really popping up no one cared it's like oh it's a female whatever like no one listens to that you know they disregard kind of stuff like that so i think that gave her an opportunity in a weird way to actually accomplish a lot of things that she did and i think that's very interesting yeah uh, and to that point carney right um the when she initially was forced to leave tennessee they thought she was a man who was writing in these journals right they didn't even know that it was, it was a woman and when they went to go look for him he he quote unquote right was gone because it was a woman in fact so i, I think you're kind of onto something with that all right so i'm going to jump into my notes bear with me because my notes are kind of scattered because the way that i watched the film was kind of broken up so bear with me um so for me one of the things that i found interesting is how um the film introduces ida b wells to chicago right and, it, and this introduction is done through the world fair and one of her greatest critiques of the World Fair was that it had no representation of the advancements that Black folks made within American society. Um, but she was attentive to the fact that Frederick Douglass was able to attend the World Fair, but Douglass's presence was only there because of the Haitians, right? The Haitian government invited Douglas to come out and speak at the World Fair, not the American government. And, and, I, and I think this is also important because Frederick, Frederick Douglass was one of the one of the first, not the only, but one of the first abolitionists um, to really look at the work of Haiti and their revolution of 1804, um, the first successful revolution to do away with enslavement, right? So he was attentive to that. And he gave several speeches echoing and praising the work of Haiti. So I think this is part of the reason why the Haitian government made sure that they invited him to be represented at the World Fair, right? But this is something that, that Ida B. Wells picks up. And she's also an understudy, if you will, of Frederick Douglass. Um, another thing, Ida B. Wells was born six months prior to emancipation or to what they call the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, and so what this does for her is her father and her mother, um, they, they lived both experiences, right? They lived as enslaved Africans and then they lived as newly um, emancipated Africans as well. But their time spent as emancipated, it really gave them a, a, a thirst to kind of improve their social conditions, right? And she was a byproduct of, of that ambition that kind of came out of this newfound freedom. Right, and it talks about how um, not only did her father obtain education, but I believe they say even her grandmother would sit in, in the classroom to make sure that she would learn as well, right? Um, and then this, I found this to be interesting too, and this kind of, for me, ties back to the second question that I asked, right? They talk about her efforts in the 1800s to desegregate public transportation, right? Um, they ask her to move to the back of the car, she refuses to do so, and an actual fight ensues, right? But the way that we're told history is that Rosa Parks was the individual who sought to desegregate the, um, the, the, the buses, right, in public transportation. But little known fact, even before Rosa Parks, right, and after Ida B. Wells, and I forget her name, I, I, should, I should have this information, but I, I just her name escapes me right now. Um, there was a sister who also did work to boy, to um, desegregate public transportation. So she refused to give up her seat to um, a white passenger. But the civil rights movement chose not to get behind her because she was um, a single mother and they felt that her status as a single mother kind of delegitimized the movement. Whereas Rosa Parks was not a single mother, she was a more respectable black woman. So we could get behind Rosa Parks in her efforts. Actually, they placed Rosa Parks there to do the bus boycott. Like that was set up, that was set up, right? But with Ida B. Wells and the sister who came before Rosa Parks, these were spontaneous things that happened, right? And the sister who came after uh, came before Rosa Parks, because she was a single mother, she did not 
they, the civil rights movement did not feel that she had the respectability politics to kind of support her, right? And I think Ida B. Wells is more so a byproduct of her time to where in the 1800s, there are no organizations like the civil rights movement, like the NAACP to kind of sit behind her and get behind her and help organize her organize her um, efforts for a larger mo social movement, right? But again, what you really do is get a sense of her, um, of her rebelliousness, right? Of her, um, of her knowing her true value and her true worth in the world. And she was not willing to let her self-worth be compromised because of oppressive forces. Um, so she's forced to relocate to Memphis. Um, in Memphis, she becomes a teacher, and she's part of what I call the intellectual milieu in Memphis, Tennessee. So there's a, a society, a community of educators that she was a byproduct and she was a part of. Um, but because of her position as an educator within the Memphis school system, um, her journalism kind of starts off by critiquing the shortcomings of educational systems in Memphis, Tennessee. And because she's critiquing the very system that's hiring her, she's not brought back to continue her role as a teacher, and she goes into the full-time role of a journalist. Um, she, um, which she became the editor of the, of the um, publication, the free, the free Speech. Um, to Leslie's point, right, we know that her, friend, her good friend Thomas Moss is lynched due to his economic um, enterprise and trying to set up a... a, a corner store, if you will, in the black side of town. Um, so this is the thing that that's kind of talked about in the film, but I want to kind of bring to, to, to great attention. The excuse, right? The excuse for these lynchings, nine times out of 10, were the perceived rape of white women, right? This is what they used as an excuse to be able to go into take folks and, and, and lynch them, right? But historically, if you look at the happenings with causes lynchings, they were predominantly revolving around economic mobility, right? So individuals within the Black community would try to set up their own businesses, try to establish some economic power, and that competition that Leslie talks about, right? Um, they feel threatened by this competition, and they use their power to go ahead and shut these um, places down that are ran by black folks to make sure that that competition does not arise, right? Um, another way of looking at this, um, is anyone familiar with the, um, the phenomenon of Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma? Has anybody heard of Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma? Another way to think about it, has anybody seen the HBO series, The Watchmen? Yeah, I watched it. Okay, so yeah. think so about- it's like the historical event of that, right? Yep. The opening scene is the scenes from the Tulsa uh, race riots in Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, 1920, I believe. Um, so here's what's significant about Tulsa, Oklahoma. It's called Black Wall Street because it has so much economic power within um, this eight block radius. Um, banks, several banks, several businesses, several um, dentistries, several medical offices, right? Um, 11 people, 11 people own private jets in this eight mile radius block in Tulsa, Oklahoma, right? This is in the 1920s. There's two airports in Oklahoma at the time, but there's 11 private jets within this small community. They had amassed so much wealth in Tulsa, Oklahoma, they were thinking about trading internationally with countries like France. That's how much money they had within this community, right? And because of, the, um, because of this vast wealth, the first bombing by civilians of a domestic neighborhood was Tulsa, Oklahoma, right? White citizens of Oklahoma got in their planes and literally dropped bombs on these areas in Oklahoma. Um, all kind of shootings, all kind of lynchings ensued, right? So I bring this up to just to drive home the point that it was rarely about white women being lynched. I'm sorry, about white, being, white women being raped, excuse me. It was more so about economic mobility and stopping the economic advancement of the black community, right? And you see this played out with um, Ida B. Wells' friend, um, Thomas Moss, okay? Um, Ferdinand Burnett is plays a very large role because as she moves to Chicago, um, she links with him and he allows her to continue her um, journalism. 
and allows her to have her voice heard through her journalistic work and allow it not to be muted as she begins to take on this phenomenon of lynching. Um, another thing I want to talk about, right? Um, we cannot strictly think about lynching from this myopic understanding of a rope, right? It, it goes so far beyond that. Um, George Floyd was lynched, right? Um, let's be clear. It is not the job of the police to serve as judge, jury, and executioner, right? What the, what the job of the police should be is to take someone into custody so that they can go to trial, right? And that trial will dictate what their sentence is, correct? This is how justice in this country is supposed to go, right? So anytime that police could come and serve as judge, jury, and executioner, they're acting as a lynch mob. Right. So to be able to come up to George Floyd and whatever it was about, us, whatever the in, initial incident was that led to his death. Right. You're acting as judge, jury and executioner. You're acting as a lynch mob. And that time that he spent on his neck. Right. Is the same action that they took back in the day that we call lynching. Right. So we cannot think of lynching solely from the phenomenon of rope being placed around someone's neck and then being hung from a space. Right. Lynching is in fact the unjust execution of anyone of culture, right? Um, by uh, hegemonic forces. So we have to kind of expand this notion of lynching. And I think that um, implicitly the documentary tried to drive that point home. Um, can we talk about that? Um, the, her, her role in the NAACP, right? Um, she was one of the um, board, original board members of, of the NAACP. And W.E.B. Du Bois, who is widely recognized as the father of the NAACP, had her removed from the board, right? And I think it's two things that play out there. In the, in the film, they say it was sexism, which I, I completely agree with. But I also believe that her work around lynching is really what got her removed from the NAACP, right? Because if they're going to place her on the board of the NAACP, then they are going to, as an organization, have to pick up this work around lynching. Because I don't believe that she would sit on that board and not want to address this project of lynching that she's been working on for 20 years, right? So I think as an organization and as the boys himself, they made a decision to say, yo, we're going to step away from that and step away from her because we don't want to deal with this issue of lynching. And this is just, this is my interpretation, right? Um, because it also sells within the film that the objectives of the NAACP become increasingly upper class, right? They're not dealing with the lower class Blacks issues. They're dealing with the high class Black issues, right? And so this is, um, to me, also allows me to think that this phenomenon of lynching that Ida B. Wells was taking up, they didn't want to deal with. Um, also to, I believe, um, I believe Leslie and Kimberly kind of mentioned how Ida B. Wells, no matter how wealthy she got, she still connected herself to the Black masses. Right. Um, she was an advocate for those who migrated from the South to Chicago, and she made sure that they were taken care of. Um, when the Black wealthy elite of Chicago tried to bifurcate or separate themselves, um, she did not do that. She continued to attach herself to the Black working masses. And I think that's very important, uh, especially if you look at our um, activists and advocates in our society today. Um, for some reason, we attach celebrity to activism. Um, and rarely do they want to get with the everyday quotidian people, right? They kind of stay up in their high society um, parties and little shit that they do, and rarely do they want to interact with us, where Ida B. Wells was the direct antithesis of that. Um, let me see. Yeah, you know, I, I'll end it there. Yeah, I'll end it there. Um, so what we'll do is transition to our fishbowl. <laughs> Um, we could talk about my notes, you could talk about your breakout rooms, or you could read from your journal, all that's okay. Um, two times per semester, and um, you have one time to pass. Does anybody want to volunteer to fishbowl? I'll volunteer. Okay, Cassandra, thank you. I'll volunteer as well. Um, Alfonso, and I'm sorry, and Leslie, okay. Can I go too, please? One second. Let me just get these other two down, and I'll see who that other person was. Alfonso, and I'm sorry, who was the last one? Me, uh, Destiny. Destiny, okay, perfect, thank you. Um, I think, um, so I see that Carlos and Khalil wanna go. I'm gonna put them down um, and we'll just see how much time we have. And if you don't get to you two, then you guys can pick up next time. 
Um, but we'll, so it's, we'll have, right? Cassandra, Leslie, Alfonso, Destiny, Khalil, and Carlos, depending on the time for Carlos and Khalil. Um, so whoever wants to start it off, it's on you. Okay, I'll go. Um, what stood out to me the most is I heard of her before and I thought they had a documentary already, but I just never found it. But what stood out to me is that she was never really scared to like, even though I'm pretty sure she was scared, but that didn't stop her from writing what she wrote, what she was passionate about. And also for, um, you know, not giving her a seat up on the bus. And when she was on her train, um, when they started collecting the tickets mm -hmm. and it was white ladies only when she refused to the conductor and like when the three, I think it was three people who tried to came, mm -hmm. come take her off, she still tried to fight and like she didn't, I don't know. I just think she's a great role model for not giving up and just sticking up for what she thought was right. Thank you, Cassandra. Who's next? But okay, um, I'll go. So what stood out to me was when how she started to her journey for journalizing because once her she oh I feel like she always had that intuition like she knew that lynching was like they just made it up because they white people wanted to um have superiority over. Um, black people even within towns because I, I read well I saw in the documentary that she like she I think in the newspaper she told or I don't know if she called but basically what happened was that she told people that to come move to where she was living because it was like um really cheap and good and I think that white people started to like notice that and then I think that's when lynching started like a again and also the fact that they would advertise that lynching was going to happen so that people could come and watch and you could even see the pictures people are like smiling or like just like they seem like so nonchalant like like yeah this is normal this is good like a good thing and that was so like scary for me how people could literally stand above like um besides or next to whatever a body that is dead and be happy and okay with that that was just so like, wow. Thank you, Leslie. Who, who's next? I'll go. Okay. Sorry if my uh, internet connection goes out midway, but I'm yeah. going to read my journal. Okay. The thesis of this video was that a woman named Ida B. Wells was fighting for equality more than a whole century before today's cry for equality. Ida B. Wells um, stood up against the violent lynching of the black men she wrote not just to inform the public of these doings, but to shame. She, she can also go down as one of the strongest and bravest women in history. Despite her parents dying at an early age, she persisted and took on the, the parental responsibilities for her siblings. She was also one to always stand up for herself. Despite all of the threats on her life, she continued to speak out. What makes me very disappointed is that this is the very first time that I've heard about her and her story. This is just a, one example of history being whitewashed and changed to make whites look better. I was also shocked that she was a co-founder of the NAACP. The equality that she was fighting for more than a century ago is similar to what is going on in today's world. Brutalities on black people are still happening in present day. The difference is that in her time, she didn't have as many, as much supporters as there is today. And I'm looking forward to one day reading her book that she wrote. Thank you, Alfonso. Uh, who's next? I'll go. Okay. Okay, so I'm just gonna read what I, I thought. Um, I believe that Ida was very brave and very powerful, like a very powerful woman. I don't understand how she wasn't scared to put herself out there, especially since um, lynching was so normalized back then. And um, ad like advertised so freely back then in the news newspapers. Since they didn't have such a like wide platform that we do now, they would put everything in the print and that's how Ida used it as she used it as an opportunity to find out the truth and to track the 
the lynching through the white people papers. <clears throat> as far as I know, she's the only one who was brave enough to do so, um, not only for herself, but for her race. She, was, she exposed lynching and found that out of 728 murders that only a third of them were accused of a crime. But throughout those, that one third of the people, um, we don't really know who was actually guilty or not. And they could have been murdered, like, especially for nothing, even though they all were. Sorry, I tried to rush so the other people had time to That's cool. um, say yeah. theirs. Thank you, Destiny. Um, so we have Khalil and Carlos. Who wants to go next? Um, I can go. Okay. Uh, I know like, I want to say, but I don't have like the words to say it yet. So I'm just like talk and figure it out later. Okay. Uh, one thing you talked about, um, the lady before uh, Rosa Parks, right? You were talking about how um, she did essentially what like Rosa Parks did, but the black activist movement didn't see her like fit for like biggest responsibility mm -hmm. because she was a single mother and I just wanted to like talk to you and like understand like why that thought process was because my understanding of like black activists like movements now they they really like idolize like single mothers and like being like strong and independent right so I was like yeah so think about um the civil rights movement of the 60s right the 50s and the 60s um, think about who makes up these movements and the organizations that make up these movements. Um, the SCLC, Southern Christian Leadership Movement, right? Um, a lot of these organizations were Christian-based religious organizations, right? So um, if you think about that, it would kind of make sense as to why single motherhood would not be widely accepted within these movements, right? Um, in the 60s and the 50s, the idea of respectability politics was very pervasive, right? So it wasn't like, um, you know, talking shit and cussing, they didn't, they weren't really about all of that, right? So they, there was a, a certain way that you're supposed to present yourself. And if you don't present yourself in this certain way, then you're gonna be opened up to a lot of the ills that black folks experience, right? Um, if, you're, if we could tie that to the film, right? There's a distinction between those who are high class Chicagoans who've been there from a, for a long time, right? From those who just recently come from the South, right? That's this idea of respectability, right? These ones who are newly coming to Chicago from the South, they don't act the way that high class Chicago people should act, right? They don't speak in the manner that they should, that they feel high class society Chicago should speak, right? So this idea of respectability is very important, especially in that time. Right. Um, so I think the respectability politics and, and, and it's really the Christian um, dynamic of that movement really calls for them to be apprehensive around supporting people, um, supporting the individual who did the first boycott or not the first, but the, did the boycott prior to Rosa Parks. Right. To whereas in our society today, um, also before I go there, right, by and large, by and large in the 50s and 60s, the black man was still in the home, right? That, that, that the family unit was still very much intact. Um, that begins to be eroded in the 70s and the 80s, right? With things like the welfare assistance programs, right? Um, things like um, public housing to where if you have a man in a house, you don't receive um, aid for public housing, right? These are systems and institutions that force the black male to be removed from the home, right? So with the black male being removed from the home, the idea of a single mother is not so um, shocking, right? It's more commonplace because systemically, there's more black men that have been removed from homes. So that's why in today's society, this idea of really supporting the single mother has really evolved, to be honest with you. Um, it's evolved because one, the, the social dynamics have changed. We don't have a lot of um, what they call nuclear families with a, a father, a mother, and children, right? Majority of, the, of families now are single parent homes. So you have to kind of adjust for that. And I think you're seeing that reflected in the modern movement. Whereas in the past, one, that was just not the case. And then two, um, respectability, and most importantly, three, religion was very pervasive within that, that movement. Does that answer your question, Khalil? No, yeah, that, that, that's exactly what I was asking. Thank you. Okay. I appreciate the insight. Thank you. Um, Carlos, you're going to round us out. 
Um, okay, so what was interesting for me was that she was a journalism, but also a writer, not just to inform, but also to shame. And she traveled to Chicago to point out with fear she was mad because of the, like you were saying, the exclusion and the, um, and how they didn't care about the African American people effort. And also, um, like you were saying, also something interesting for me was that his friend Frederick Douglass was the only black in American black American um, abolitionist, but he was also a public speaker. And yeah, and also something interesting is that I like how she read every weekend the um, newspaper for her parents and friends because her parents did not know how to read, and also they were they went to learn how to read at the old age. Yeah. And they were also excited about the freedom. Yeah, that's a very good call out, Carlos. Um, and for me, what that really speaks to is like the innate desire of African people to obtain education, right? Like even in, in their old age, they were doing what they had to do to make sure that they were literate. Um, one thing I, I do want to piggyback on that was discussed through the, uh, the fishbowl, and you guys did a phenomenal job. Um, I believe it was Cassandra who was saying that the, the lynchings were advertised. And they were placed in the paper so everyone could come out and kind of view them. I want you to, I, I'm going to bring this up so you can understand how ingrained the phenomenon of lynching was into American culture. Um, does anyone know the etymology of the term picnic? So when I say etymology, it's just like the, the historical origin of the word. No? So, the historical origin of the picnic is to pick a nigga and hang him. That's really where picnic derives from, right? And um, if you think about how it's being advertised, okay, in, the, in those newspapers, literally families would come up, pack their lunches, right? Go out and watch this as if it was a sporting event, okay? And not only would they watch it as if it was a sporting event, they would take home souvenirs, right? So part of these lynchings would be a disembodiment. So arms would be cut off, fingers would be cut off, the genitalia would be cut off, right? And I don't remember the name of the documentary, but it's a PBS documentary that I was watching. And it talks about how these homes in the South are being sold, right? And because those homes are being sold, they have to clear out the basements. And when they would go into these homes' basements and clear them out, they would find these body parts being preserved in jars. And these would be body parts of folks who were lynched, right? Being held in these homes as souvenirs. Um, they would take pictures of these things and, and email them, out, not email them, excuse me, and send them out as postcards, right? So this is how ingrained the phenomenon of lynching was into American society. Um, if you wanna kind of understand it at a deeper level, James Baldwin has a book called Going to Meet, it's a short story, it's about a 10 page short story called Going to Meet the Man. And he, he does a phenomenal job of talking about how um, lynching is almost identified as a um, rite of passage for the white male. And it's something that, that the father shows to his son, so the son shows to the grandson, and it passes this thing down as a tradition, right? Um, almost like, um, how you pass baseball now to your son, right? And, and, and Baldwin does a very descriptive job of um, articulating that. Yes, it's, it's extremely disgusting, but this is American history, right? Um, okay, bet. So I think we, you know, y'all did a really good job of covering this. Um, I'm curious to hear other thoughts from people who we haven't heard from. Um, and we could go a couple of ways, right? Um, we could talk about Ida B. Wells, or we could just talk about the role and the work of women. Um, being a face from history. That's another way we can kind of take this conversation. Um, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Uh, actually, if you want, Kimberly, kind of, if you, you kind of pick up on this, what you put in the chat and give us a little bit more of your thoughts around um, this, the obsession that you're attentive to. Um, I mean, like, obsessed and, like, that's kind of weird. Like, as much as it's, they say that they were, like, disgusted by them, like, you wouldn't think that they would want to keep, like, you know, body parts and stuff like that. Like, if you like hated them so much and you didn't like them, like why would you want to keep 
you know body parts and that's just so sad because you could also see that in the pictures like in the documentary like they were happy like they were laughing you wouldn't think like you know like that's a human being you would think that they would see that and be like disgusted and like not want to like praise that and I just I just think that's really weird how like they always say like they're they're so disgusted by by black people but yet they're so like in a way they're kind of obsessed and like they you know I don't know that's just kind of that's interesting to learn about and it's kind of weird at the same time yeah it's a um it's a strange contradiction right um and there's a lot of so there's this theory called Afro pessimism that kind of deals with what you're attentive to, Kimberly, in the sense that um, the Afro pessimism argues that the Western world needs the black other to authenticate itself, right? So I need someone to point out and point out their deficiencies to validate my existence, and, and that's kind of what you're what you're kind of the, the obsession that you're talking about. Um, if you go deep into Afro pessimist literature. Um, they really deal with this idea at a very profound level. Um, other thoughts? Uh, I just wanted to <clears throat> throw out there, uh, I don't know if you guys seen the movie called uh, Mudbound, hmm. but it was a 2017 film, you should watch it. It's really good. Um, and it kind of, you could see how uh, it actually shows like the economic struggle of like black owned farms and then how like uh, what a deed is and then how like white males would just move around and just be like oh well this is my farm now like you know just you know they've been working on this farm for so many years that they just come and take it over and like no one could do anything about it but that movie really shows that like to a pinpoint and it's really well done just wanted to throw it out there thank you I, um, it's on netflix correct uh, yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. Sure, for sure. Um, other comments, other thoughts? I was thinking about um, kind of like uh, the, the W.E.B. Du Bois reading from last week where I was just thinking about Ida and how like what a powerhouse she was and like like, like some of these people it's like if they what like what kind of like realms of like greatness i mean she was great and what she did was incredible but like if she didn't have all this other yeah. shit she had to overcome like what kind of just like because she was such a dynamo and a powerhouse with so much energy it's just like um it's like her story was so beautiful but it was also just kind of like yeah you know all the stuff that she had to deal with like what she could have done yeah and even like to, to your point, Cole, like imagine if instead of trying to remove her from the NAACP, the boy supported her, right? And, and gave her, um, not gave her, because that's the, that's my way to phrase that, but allowed her to be as great and dynamic as she was able to be. What would that have done not only for the NAACP, but for African people as a whole, right? So so I, I agree with you, Cole. I think um, I'm also was attentive to the men's role in diminishing her presence in history. And, and that, that's something that to me that was very, um, it's painful, right? Because I, someone who looks up to Du Bois, right? Like I look at Du Bois as one of the greatest scholars of, our, of any time, right? But to know that he, um, what he was struggling against, he did to his sister, right? To me, it, it's, that's a kind of a grave contradiction. Um, and, and then in the, um, who was, I, I believe it was Alfonso who was saying in the, in the fishbowl, that there's the, the whitewashing of her history. And, and for me, I thought, yeah, it was the whitewashing, but also there was a male washing, right? Like there were men that were taking away her role in history. And, and, and to me, that, that was really um, profoundly, profoundly painful because again, to your point, Cole, what could have been if we really allow, allow if men to, were to remove themselves and allow her to, again, I don't even wanna say allow, but to remove themselves and let her, I don't even wanna say let, I don't know, or just, that brilliance and that greatness to not be limited, put it that way, yeah. Um, I wanna do this with the last 10 minutes of class. Um, I gave you all homework assignments last week and I wanna talk about that a little bit. Um, the homework assignment was um, when you typically code switch, don't, um, but do be safe about it, right? And, and see how that looks, feels, and feels for you. Um, was anyone able to do the assignment? 
uh, yeah. How, how was that for <laughs> Yeah, surprisingly. I never really realized it. And then, uh, then I realized uh, I actually do it a lot with like phone calls. Mm. Very weird. But like if I, like a known person calling me or whatever, like I literally, I talk in like a very weird way <laughs> I realized. And uh, I stopped doing that in the past week and uh, felt good. Felt yeah. like, eh, you know, it's like, all right, well, you know, it's just a phone call. <laughs> And, and yeah, I, think, I don't know. I, I guess it was just, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, Connie, like, I think that's part of the project, right? Is, is to do it and realize, like, the world didn't end, right? Shit's still cool. Like, you know what I mean? Because I think part of the yeah. reason why we do this is we're afraid what could happen if we're ourselves. And part of the yeah. project is to say, like, yo, you can't be yourself and the world ain't going to fucking end. You'll be all right. Yeah. yeah. yeah it was, it was, I, that was, I was actually mind blown when I realized that. I really was like, Wow, because I, I do it without even thinking about right. it. It's sure. almost like, you know, yeah. like, you know, this is really, I mean, I guess like a part of it was just like, I guess I was like taught or influenced that, oh, that's like a proper way mm -hmm. to like speak. But then at the same time, it's like, wait a minute, that's not even me though. Like, it's like, I could speak like that, but if I meet in person, then you'd be like, who the hell is this? You know, like, right. might as well just <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Connie. Uh, I'm no looking problem. at the, the the chat, Carlos. Do you want to kind of speak on um, what your experience was with the code switching assignment? Carlos. Um. No, yeah, Carlos, I'm asking you to say what you put in the chat out loud so everyone can hear what your thoughts were or your experience was with the uh, code switching assignment. Oh, I just feel weird because nobody couldn't understand what I was saying. And I, I was feeling like the fish out of the water. So how did you code? How did you not code switch? Can I explain that to us, Carlos? Um, I don't know. That was just like a simple what was, it, was it like linguistic? So you you spoke Spanish in a space where you didn't normally speak Spanish, or, or what, what, what did you do? I, I was doing Spanglish, a little bit of both. And but my friend, my friends, they are um, Latin American, but they still couldn't understand me because they feel more free speaking in English than in Spanish. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, I I feel good speaking in in English, but I feel more Free, more comfortable speaking Spanish. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Um, and, and I always encourage my bilingual students, right? Like, because I, when I, I'm attentive to when I peep, they'll be trying to explain something and they're looking for the words in English. I'm like, yo, fuck it, just say, say it in Spanish, right? Like, I may not understand that shit, right? But you know what you're saying. And I'm sure someone else in this class understands what, I, what, what you're saying and they can translate it to me, right? Like let your authentic voice and, and the voice that you hear when you think, utilize that. I have no problem with that. So anytime Carlos or anyone, right? You're having a hard time articulating something in your second tongue, feel free to use the first and, and we'll work out the translation on the back end. Um, who else would like to share their experience with the uh, code switching project? Ryan, were you able to try the assignment? No, i am be honest with you. I couldn't get myself to do it. Okay. Well, um, for those who haven't been able to do it, it's an ongoing project, right? So try it next week. And if it don't work next week, try it the week after that. Just continue to try it because, um, again, as I was mentioning, Carney, it, it, part of it is just to have you realize that, yo, it's okay to be yourself. And, and what happens in my experiences, nine times out of 10, one of two things happens. Either one, people respect you for being yourself, right? And then two, it encourages them to be more of themselves, right? And, and when I was in my, in going to classwork, coursework in my PhD program, again, I'll come into class and I'll be myself cussing all that, right? By the middle of the semester, the professor is using slang, cussing and doing all that, right? So it creates a space for comfort for everyone, right? And it, it is it is a power and being able to step into any space 
and be yourself, right? Um, it's a power to make a space conform to you opposed to you conforming to that space. I'm gonna say that one more time. There's a power in stepping into a space and the space conforms to you opposed to you conforming to the space that you're stepping into. There's a power in that. And I want you all to experience that power and begin to uh, manipulate and utilize that power because that's that divine self, right? That's when you start to tap into this purpose that I've been talking about for the whole semester, right? So this is part of that project. Um, so again, uh, there's no readings this week. Tomorrow at the latest Friday, I will e email out to you all and place on the Google Classroom site your midterm study guides. Um, Wednesday of next week, we'll spend all course um, going over those study guides, answering any questions you all may have, um, and just kind of ironing out that and making sure that you're comfortable with, the, um, with your midterms. Um, Thursday or Thursday of next week, I will email out to you all the midterms and they'll be due that following Monday. Um, if there's any other questions, comments, or concerns before then, don't hesitate to holler at me. I'll be happy to assist you wherever it may be. Be healthy, be wealthy, be wise. Get your exercise, your water, and vitamin D. Peace, y'all. Be well. All right, Destiny. Thank you. You're welcome, Carney. Have a good one, man. Thank you. All right, Cole. Have a good one, man. All right, Michelle. Have a good one. Khalil, you good?